The past week proved to be exceptionally challenging for Kevin. Mainly due to the dual responsibilities of defending his thesis and completing final exams at the Boston University School of Law. Recognizing the critical nature of the situation, Kevin was fully aware that he couldn't afford any mistakes. Consequently, he dedicated a substantial amount of effort to ensure excellence in his exams. The joy that awaited his mother was immeasurable. She had harbored dreams of this moment for an extended period. With a smile, the law school graduate reflected on his journey. Prior to university, he had served in the Marine Corps, a valuable experience that paved the way for his admission into the law program. Penelope Thompson, a devoted mother, had single-handedly raised him since he was ten. Following the tragic loss of her husband in a car accident, it was Penelope's unwavering insistence that Kevin pursue higher education after completing high school, despite his desire to test his abilities in the military first. Mrs. Thompson saw the potential for a bright and successful future in her son. Born in a small town in southern Massachusetts, Kevin viewed Boston as the epicenter of the universe. Despite his busy schedule with school, he had rarely found time to visit his mother, Penelope. Understanding the challenges he faced, never pressured him for frequent visits. Kevin, though plagued by guilt, prioritized his education. It was only after successfully defending his thesis that he could savor a newfound sense of freedom. This realization prompted him to plan a surprise visit to his mother. Acknowledging the importance of reconnecting with his roots and the person who believed in his potential all along, opting for the element of surprise. Kevin decided to return home unannounced. Clutching his diploma like a true lawyer. Immersed in the idea. He meticulously planned the visit to ensure his mother remained oblivious. Two days before the trip. Kevin turned off his phone. Contemplating the possibility of his mother deciding to call and check on him during that period. He chuckled at the thought. Wanting the surprise to be perfect. The journey home took several hours. And he arrived in his hometown in the evening brimming with excitement and a constant smile, eager to share his achievement. Kevin couldn't wait to present his diploma to his mother. This credential granted him the right to practice law at any financial institution in the city. Approaching his home, Kevy, and quickened his pace, barely containing the urge to break into a run. However, upon reaching the porch and knocking on the door, he made an unsettling discovery, the door was locked, and the blinds were drawn. This was unusual. His mother never kept the blinds down, as she loved warmth and sunlight, and the door was always unlocked. Perplexed, Kevin hesitated but knocked again, without his own key, as his mother had recently changed the locks. He grew impatient. Concerned, he attempted to call his mother, only to find her phone silent. The operator's voice informed him that the subscriber was out of the network range. Puzzled and increasingly worried, Kevin couldn't comprehend why his mother, who never turned off her phone, was unreachable. In that moment, a young woman in her twenties emerged from the neighboring house. She cast a glance at Kevin, a mix of surprise and disapproval evident in her eyes. Her judgmental gaze sent shivers down Kevin's spine. His mother had mentioned that a young woman and her parents had recently moved in next door, but he had never met her personally. Good evening. Miss. I'm. I'm sorry. Do you happen to know Penelope Thompson? Is she home? Kevin asked. Attempting to contain his excitement. The neighbor hesitated for a moment. Then suddenly covered her face with her hands and burst into tears. Kevin approached her. Unsure of what to say. However. The stranger initiated the conversation. I'm sorry you don't know. Do you? Mrs. Thompson passed away two days ago. She was buried yesterday. We tried to reach you but couldn't get through. Kevin's head spun from everything he had just heard. Just yesterday. He was planning a surprise visit for his mother. And today he learned that she was no longer alive. Tears welled up in Kevin's eyes. The joy he felt from his graduation was replaced with bitter sadness over losing the most important person in his life. How did it happen? Kevin asked in a trembling voice. The neighbor turned pale but answered his question nonetheless, a heart attack. Mrs. Thompson had been complaining of chest pain lately. But she didn't want to see a doctor. 
She was waiting for Kevin. Hoping he'd come. In that moment. Kevin felt an overwhelming sense of guilt. Devoting all his energy to his studies. He had virtually stopped caring for his mother. Who was waiting for help from her only son. His belated remorse combined with an overwhelming sense of guilt left Kevin demoralized. Making it difficult for him to think. Straight. If you want. You could visit your mother's grave. She was buried next to your father. I'm April. By the way. Don't hesitate to reach out if you need help. It won't be a problem for me. Oh. And here's a key. The neighbor added before walking away. She understood that Kevin needed some time alone to process the news. Kevin stood on the porch. Still in disbelief about what had happened. Just yesterday. His life was full of opportunities and colors. And now it had turned into a gray and desolate existence. Despite the fact that it was already getting dark. Kevin decided to visit his mother's grave right away. Mrs. Thompson was buried next to her husband. And Kevin knew the location well, situated right by the entrance. A few yards from the gate. Not being superstitious. Kevin believed that one should fear the living. Not the dead. He didn't hesitate to go to the cemetery during the dark hours. Though it looked unpleasant and somewhat eerie at this time of day. Kevin paid no attention. All he wanted was to kneel at his mother's grave and ask for her forgiveness. However, as Kevin approached the fresh grave mound, he heard a strange squeaking sound, vaguely reminiscent of either a cry or a muffled moan. He froze in place, unsure of what to make of the unsettling noise. His heart pounded loudly, causing discomfort. Lacking belief in the supernatural, Kevin was convinced that such sounds could only come from a living creature. When the mysterious sound repeated, he pinpointed its source, his mother's grave. Approaching cautiously, he leaned over the fresh earth and saw a strange bundle about a foot and a half in size. Or perhaps a little larger. Whispering with fear, he wondered, what on earth is this? The moving bundle sent a shiver of terror down his spine. Summoning courage, Kevin discovered that it was a swaddled baby. Feeling the warmth of Kevin's hands. The baby perked up and began to fuss. Clutching the precious find. Kevin hurried towards the exit. At that moment. His focus shifted entirely to saving the baby. Pushing aside thoughts of his departed mother. Instead of going home. Kevin went to see April. Believing she would know what to do in the situation. Finding Kevin at her doorstep with the baby in his arms. April froze. Having been in a similar situation before. It took her some time to understand what was happening. Seeing the hesitancy and suspicion in her eyes. Kevin quickly explained. Please help me. I found this baby in the city cemetery. I don't know how or why it ended up there. But I really need your help as neighbors. His words had the effect of a cold shower on April. She took the baby in her arms and went into her bedroom to change his diaper. As it turned out. April did have some experience in this matter. Mainly because her older sister had recently had a baby. April often took care of her niece while the baby's mother ran errands. While April cared for the baby. Kevin went to the nearest pharmacy to buy baby formula. Realizing that the baby was probably very hungry and time was of the essence. Fortunately. Luck was on Kevin's side that day. He quickly purchased formula and a pack of diapers and ran back to April. Who was waiting with the baby in her arms. April prepared the formula and started feeding the baby. But she asked Kevin to check the baby's blanket in the meantime. Why do I need to do this? It's just a regular blanket. Isn't it? Kevin asked. However. When he unfolded the blanket. He immediately understood what April was talking about. He found a rolled up note with an address written on it. Making Kevin think it was directly related to the baby he found. Since it was already late. Kevin decided not to take immediate action and planned to visit the address in the morning. Exhausted from the day's events. He fell asleep on the couch in April's living room without even changing his clothes. His understanding neighbor made sure he had a peaceful night. Satisfied after being fed. The baby fell into a deep sleep. Reassuring April that he was in good health. The next morning. Kevin woke up at dawn. After hastily drinking a cup of coffee made by April. He headed to the address written on the note. Even from a distance. Kevin could tell that wealthy people lived there. 
a three-story mansion with a terrace, tennis court, and a huge swimming pool spoke volumes. Timidly glancing around, Kevin approached the front door and rang the doorbell. He immediately heard someone's footsteps on the other side, and the door was later opened by a tall man in his thirties dressed in a bathrobe. Is something wrong? Who are you? A courier or a negotiator? Do you have news about our son? The homeowner bombarded Kevin with questions. In that moment, Kevin realized that the man standing before him was most likely the baby's father. When he saw the figure of the man's wife behind him, everything fell into place. As Kevin would later find out, the missing baby's name was Josh Miller. He had been kidnapped THR. E.E. days ago with the intention of demanding a ransom. Negotiations had lasted for about two days but had ultimately led nowhere. Albert Miller, the father, was willing to pay any amount to save his son, making that very clear during the negotiations. However, the kidnappers didn't believe Albert Miller for some reason and decided to terminate all communications with the child's parents. Learning that Kevin had found their son, Albert and Diana Miller were ready to literally carry him on their shoulders. Never before had Kevin experienced such an emotional uplift brought about by the feeling that he had done the right thing. Thankfully, being still very young, little Josh didn't even realize that he had been kidnapped and treated the whole experience as a small adventure. Meanwhile, Albert Miller expressed his gratitude to Kevin in the most generous way possible by hiring him as the lead attorney in one of his firms. Now Kevin was able to gain extensive experience. Confident that his path to career success was clear. However, that wasn't the only reason why the kidnapping case left an incredible mark on Kevin. There was another circumstance that eclipsed even his career achievements. Kevin fell in love. And not with just anyone. But with his neighbor April. With whom he had rescued little Josh. After everything they'd been through. They started dating and quickly developed a deep mutual affection. Following a whirlwind romance. Kevin and April tied the knot just half a year later. Some people speculated that their haste was due to April's pregnancy. There's no way to say whether it was true or not. But judging by the joyful look in Kevin's eyes, the rumors about April's pregnancy were probably not unfounded. Every Sunday, Kevin came to his mother's grave to ask for forgiveness. In those moments, the sun invariably appeared in the sky, and its warm rays brushed against Kevin's cheeks as if to convey the message that Mrs. Thompson had long forgiven her son. What do you think of this story? Let's expect what will happen in the next story. Brittany knocked on her neighbor's door. And Brooke opened it. Staring at her classmate in surprise. Do you have anything to eat? Asked Brittany as she entered the room. Yes. Come in. Brooke offered. They sat at the table. Which served as both a lunch and writing table. And Brittany began to eat pasta. Telling Brooke about her unsuccessful date. Brittany. An attractive young woman. Always attracted attention from men eager to me. Eat and spend time with her. However. Brittany harbored dreams of sophisticated dining. Luxurious cars. And a romantic marriage proposal. Despite her active foray into online dating. Her experiences were far from ideal. One evening. She found herself on a date with a frugal companion who took her to a budget-friendly diner, prompting her swift departure upon realizing the lack of excitement. Contrastingly, just the day before yesterday, Brittany encountered a wealthy and generous man. Despite their affluent background, the evening took an unexpected turn. The man insisted on attending a Chinese porcelain exhibition, where they strolled amidst vases and plates while he shared obscure facts about the emperors of the dinosaur era and other seemingly tedious topics. The cinematic experience that followed was no escape. As they ventured into an art house film, leaving Brittany unimpressed with the overall monotony of the encounter. Am I really so unlucky with men? Ha! Huh? Brittany sighed, expressing her frustration. Don't worry. You'll find someone else. Brooke replied uncertainly. Feeling disheartened, Brittany decided to call it a night and went to sleep in her room. Knowing she had college the next day, the following day in class, Brittany found herself on the receiving end of the professor's hostile gaze, as if she were to blame for his own perceived unattractiveness, weight, and probable loneliness. The professor criticized her academic performance, 
accusing her of skipping lectures and insinuating that she had more important things to do than study. Brittany, eager to salvage her academic standing, assured the professor that she was trying her best. However, he remained unconvinced, suggesting that attending lectures might be a good starting point. Faced with the prospect of expulsion, Brittany frantically considered her options. Attempting to change the situation, the professor proposed a dubious agreement, eyeing Brittany suggestively. Seizing the opportunity, Brittany flirted with him, leaning forward to showcase her allure. Aware of her attractiveness, she suspected the professor had his eye on her. A suspicion confirmed by his blushing reaction. The professor, emboldened, asked if he could invite her somewhere. Brittany, playing along, agreed and expressed complete trust in his taste. The exchange escalated quickly as the professor, overcome with excitement, kissed her hand. Unbeknownst to them, two students eavesdropped on their conversation outside the door. Shocked by what they had heard, the students promptly reported the incident to the vice-rector, who happened to be the wife of the amorous professor. In the evening, Brittany and the professor ventured to a restaurant and later to his house. The man was confident that his wife wouldn't be home for at least another three hours. However, their rendezvous took an unexpected turn when the door to the bedroom suddenly opened, revealing the professor's wife. A scandal ensued, marked by shouting and tears. The professor, in a state of confusion, frantically ran around the room collecting his clothes, while Brittany sat on the bed, horrified by the unfolding scene. The wife, looking at her husband with a mixture of hatred and pity, confronted him about his infidelity. She reminded him of their thirty years together, grown children, and two grandchildren, expressing disappointment that he continued to cheat on her. Turning her gaze to Brittany, the wife declared her expulsion from the situation. The verdict was pronounced. Two weeks later, Brittany found herself on an old bus, shaken by the events that had transpired. Her elderly neighbor, a lively woman, filled the journey with village news. Brittany, contemplating her choices, regretted accepting her friend's offer to spend the summer at her country house. Unable to face her parents after the expulsion, she had lied about passing exams and decided to stay in the city for the holidays. As the bus turned off the road and stopped, an elderly lady informed Brittany that her relative, Anthony, would be there to meet her. Anthony, around forty years old, tall, with neatly combed light hair and gray eyes, appeared attractive to Brittany. The elderly woman playfully mentioned visiting her grandchildren and the city as she hurried towards an old pickup truck. Brittany, stepping off the bus with her fashionable suitcase, observed people dispersing in different directions. Anthony greeted her and offered a ride, sparking curiosity about the new chapter unfolding in her life. That's good. Anthony nodded approvingly, his gaze fixed on the pretty stranger with chestnut curls and green eyes. Hello. Who are you going to visit in this backward area? I came to your area to rest. Brittany replied thoughtfully. Well, there's nothing much to see here. Anthony laughed, his infectious laughter causing Brittany to smile. I am quite satisfied with the river, fresh air, and the beautiful nature. She added. Anthony was surprised when he learned, Ed that Brittany was going to live in the old Blake's house, considering it had long been uninhabitable. Brittany shrugged helplessly, expressing uncertainty. Well, I'll manage somehow. She said. I was told there are tools in the barn. Anthony shook his head, loaded her suitcase into the trunk, and then opened the back door. Get in. We'll figure out the house somehow. Meanwhile, Chloe, in another setting, kneaded dough with a smile, stealing glances at her quiet children who were engrossed in building something with Legos on the floor. Despite being unable to give birth, Chloe loved her adopted children as if they were her own. She and her husband had adopted a boy and a girl from an orphanage when they were five and three years old, respectively. Before adopting, they had tried various methods to have their own child from seeing doctors to visiting shamans and psychics. But without success, faced with the possibility of divorce, Chloe suggested that her husband leave her to pursue a family. However, he stayed, 
reasoning that they would live together no matter what fate had in store. Eventually, the idea of adoption was born. Chloe, engaged in baking a pie, meticulously cleaned the house, creating a warm and welcoming atmosphere for her family. Despite being a city girl and the daughter of wealthy parents, Chloe took immense pride in her housekeeping skills. Having moved to the countryside three years ago, she had fully embraced rural life, learning to bake pies, milk goats, and tend to chickens, essential skills for survival in the village. As Chloe went about her chores, the dog's happy barking signaled Anthony's arrival. A minute later, her husband appeared, hanging up his jacket and scrutinizing his reflection in the mirror. Chloe, surprised by his attention to appearance, remarked on his tardiness, noting that it was already half past seven. Anthony, nonchalant, explained that he had given a lift to a city girl, Henry Blake's granddaughter, who had rented out the house for the summer. Chloe, aware of the uninhabited state of the house, asked if the girl had come alone, to which Anthony confirmed and mentioned that she was a student. The next day, Anthony returned to help Brittany. He set the table, fixed a stall, and hung a hammock in the yard. Brittany, grateful, playfully expressed her thanks. But Anthony, embodying the simplicity of village life, insisted that thanks were enough. Observing Anthony's skills, Brittany remarked that he didn't seem like a villager. Anthony laughed and shared that he had moved from the city with his wife and children. Brittany, attempting to conceal her disappointment at the news of Anthony's marital status, expressed interest in hearing how he ended up in the village. Anthony shrugged, recounting a summer from his past when he used to visit his grandmother. A confrontation with local boys escalated when they told him to leave, prompting Anthony to throw a stone in defense. However, the stone accidentally hit a car, shattering its glass, and leaving Anthony in shock like a statue. Then the door of the house opened, and the same girl came out, casting a glance at the car. She asked, Did you break it? I nodded. Soon, her father emerged, assessing the situation and starting to yell. However, the girl calmly explained that she had accidentally broken it citing a big dog that had frightened her, leading her to throw a stone. Her father, looking at her affectionately, patted her on the head, apologized to me, and retreated into the house. Inspired by the encounter, I began courting the girl. Every day, I left wildflowers under her gate, even catching fish in the river one day and leaving it on their doorstep. Her father, unimpressed, threw away the fish scolding me for what he deemed a village joke. Undeterred, I decided to express my feelings through a love letter, placing it in the mailbox. Although her mother retrieved the letter, she didn't tear it up. Instead, she gave it to her daughter. Brittany, captivated by the romantic tale, clapped her hands, urging Anthony to continue. And then, I got many bad grades in school and didn't return to the village anymore. I stayed home focusing on my studies during the summer. Later, when I returned to my grandmother's house, the girl was nowhere to be found. Years passed. I joined the army. In the second year of service, I received a letter from my mother informing me of my grandmother's death. At the funeral, a beautiful girl approached me, and to my surprise, it was the same girl. She had grown up, become even more beautiful. And, in short, I fell in love again, this time. Seriously. Brittany gasped in anticipation. And did she? Yes. Anthony confirmed. I finished my service. We got married. And then we adopted children and moved here. Oh. Really? You adopted kids? You're a saint. Exclaimed Brittany. Anthony smiled. Continuing his story. Charlie. Ah. Come on. I just always wanted children. Anthony explained, hesitating. Why? Brittany nodded understandingly, acknowledging the personal nature of the matter. I understand everything. She added. After Anthony left, he couldn't shake off a strange feeling of shame and awkwardness. He felt ashamed for unintentionally comparing Brittany to his wife and awkward because the comparison wasn't in his wife's favor. Lost in thought, 
Brittany sat in her bedroom that evening. The revelation that the handsome Anthony was married and had two children left her somewhat upset. As she put on her pajamas, she noticed movement out of the corner of her eye. On alert. She called out. Who's there? Come out and show yourself. After some rustling sounds and silence, Brittany felt uneasy. Ten minutes later, while trying to fix a hole in the fence, Anthony caught her in this activity. Surprised. He asked what she was doing. And Brittany answered a little irritably. I'm repairing the fence. Can you help? Anthony agreed to help and walked into the yard. Brittany explained what had happened. And Anthony chuckled. Good natured. He assured her that the neighbor, old Tom, hadn't been interested in such activities for a long time and was beyond suspicion. Brittany insisted that she had heard someone rustling around. Anthony walked up to the fence, leaned into the gap, and beckoned Brittany over. He pointed to a dog, explaining that the dog was the source of the rustling. Brittany laughed, realizing her mistake. Nevertheless, Anthony decided to nail up the gaps for Brittany's peace of mind. Grateful. Brittany watched as Anthony quickly began hammering away, attaching pine slats to the largest gaps. Anthony felt Brittany's gaze on his back and once again compared her to his wife, finding the comparison not in his wife's favor. Meanwhile, Anthony's friend Jack was looking for him. Upon entering the house, he asked Chloe about Anthony's whereabouts. Chloe, surprised, replied, at work. Where else would he be? Don't you work together? Why all the questions? Jack scratched his balding head, looking puzzled. He's not there. I've been looking for him all day. I need permission to get the parts. But I can't reach him. Jack explained. Expressing his frustration, he said his goodbyes, hopped on his motorcycle, and leisurely drove down the street, turning his head to search for the familiar blue pickup. Soon, he spotted the car parked at the gate of an old, uninhabitable house. However, the house no longer looked abandoned, windows were open, women's clothes hung on a lee, any in the yard, and the door was ajar. Jack got off his motorcycle and knocked on the door. Voices and hurried footsteps could be heard inside the house. Anthony opened the door, looking peculiar, disheveled, shirtless, with his belt undone, without words. Everything became clear to Jack. Despite being Anthony's friend, as an exemplary family man, Jack did not welcome such frivolity. Flustered, he explained, I need to sign some papers. I'm going to get the parts. I've been looking for you all over the workshop. And I couldn't reach you. Have the papers with you? Anthony asked irritably. Jack pulled out a folder from his backpack and handed it to Anthony without looking. Anthony signed the papers with a flourish. When Jack inquired about his presence, Anthony sternly looked at his friend and emphasized. You didn't see anything. Got it? Jack nodded uncertainly. Anthony reached out his hand and squeezed it tightly looking meaningfully into his eyes. Just don't ask about anything. Okay. I haven't figured out how it happened yet. Jack had no intention of asking about anything. He felt sorry for Chloe and her two young children and was disappointed in his friend. Which hurt the most. Days went by. And Anthony's behavior became increasingly strange. He came home late. Ate quickly and silently. Answered questions with monosyllabic or standard phrases. Chloe couldn't shake a nasty, unexplained feeling, imagining the worst scenarios. She wanted to believe Anthony, but her concerns only grew worse. Chloe didn't even notice when Susan, Jack's wife and her friend, entered the house. Susan, proud to consider herself part of the village's intellectual elite, worked at the library and was well-read. Hi. Jeffley. Greeted Chloe. You look like you're going to the conference. What are you thinking about? About trust. How do you think? If a man loves, he'll deceive. Chloe answered a question with a question. Love is often elevated to some absurd level in books. But even love is not a panacea for deceit. It's a well known fact that people lie. Those who are honest towards some people can be very calculating and cunning towards others. Such is the paradox. My friend, someone deceives under pressure of circumstances. Someone for a mere ego boost. 
and someone simply cannot imagine their existence without lies. But not trusting anyone means being in constant stress. Looking for hidden meanings everywhere. Exhausting oneself and others with doubts. You cannot love. But if yo. You don't trust. Why bother starting a relationship at all? Susan expounded. Chloe sighed. Susan's musings added to her confusion. Perhaps she needed to act. Simply talk to her husband heart to heart. And then see what would happen. However. The conversation did not take place. It so happened that Chloe found out about her husband's infidelity. Seeing everything with her own eyes. After talking a little more with her friend. Chloe saw her off and. Looking at the clock again. Dialed her husband's number. He was unavailable again. Without thinking for long. She left the house and walked down the street. People were walking towards her. Some from the farm. Some from the sawmill. And some from the machine shop. Chloe saw Jack. Hi. Do you know where Anthony is? She asked him. How would I know? Jack became nervous and looked away. Am I his supervisor? Don't be so foggy. Chloe questioned. I can see that you're hiding something. I'm tired. I'm going home. Jack turned away quickly and hurried down the street. Chloe watched him for a long time and went towards the river. Where the Blake's house was located. Approaching. She saw her husband's car at the beginning of the twilight. And the light in the house. No longer hoping to see anything good. She looked into the windows. Her husband was embracing and kissing a young stranger who was practically without clothes. Chloe felt as if someone was choking her. But she managed to control herself. Open the door. And enter the house. Seeing her. Anthony froze. And Chloe looked at him disdainfully and left the house. The woman practically ran down the street. Trying with all her might not to cry. The sound of an engine was heard behind her. Chloe. Wait. Listen. Anthony leaned out of the car window. He looked pitiful. His hair disheveled. And his eyes frightened. Wait. Let me explain. Chloe stopped. Turned to him. And crossed her arms over her chest. Explain. She demanded. Squinting. Well. Try to explain. I don't even know how it happened. Anthony mumbled. I lost my mind. Made a mistake. It happens. Please forgive me. Chloe really wanted to hit him. She probably would have done it if there weren't people on the road who threw curious glances at them. Let's talk at home. She said shortly. And walked down the road. Anthony slowly followed. Get in the car. He asked. It looks strange. I'm driving. You're walking. Think about what people will say. Is that all you care about? Chloe replied bitterly. They covered the entire path home the same way, she was on foot. He was driving. At home. Chloe sat on the sofa and quietly cried. She didn't throw stools at him or smash plates. But these quiet tears of his wife were more frightening to him than any screams and scandals. Let's forget about this. He asked again. Do you want me to go to her right now and tell her that there's nothing between us? Do you want that? I love only you. Yes. I want. I want you to pack your things and leave. She sobbed. I'm not interested in where you go, to her or anyone else. I won't pack anything. He frowned. Then I'll help you. Chloe shrugged. Opened the closet door. And within five minutes. Anthony's suitcase was filled with his clothes. Take your things and leave. She said firmly. Anthony walked out of the house with his head down. He drove to the end of the street. Stopped at Jack's house. And honked. His friend came out immediately. As if waiting. He looked at the suitcase on the back seat and sighed sympathetically. She kicked you out. Anthony nodded and pulled out cigarettes. Handing one to his friend. They smoked in silence. Well. I was thinking. Anthony finally said. Starting tomorrow. I'm going on vacation. You stay for me. I'll go to the sea with Brittany. She's never been there before. And I need to rest. Get a grip. Jack protested. Your family is falling apart. And you're going to resorts with your mistress. What's wrong with you? It's none of your business. You better keep an eye on things here while I'm gone. Anthony threw away the cigarette. Started the car. And drove to Brittany. 
Jack shook his head and walked home, inwardly shuddering at his friend's actions. The next day, Anthony grabbed his mistress and took her to the sea to relax and get revenge. While his faithful wife was left alone with the two children. Ten days later. In the village. Jack enthusiastically hugged his brother. Hey bro. He slapped Charles on the shoulders. How long has it been since we've seen each other? A couple of years. Probably. Charles smiled. Jack looked at his cousin's shiny car. R. He said admiringly. Touching the shiny wing of the black BMW. Thanks. Charles replied modestly. Business is going well. I can afford it. Good for you. Jack said. Pointing to his Ford. Which had seen better days. And I'm still on the same old horse. Not bad either. Charles touched the worn handles. Susan clapped her hands. Oh. Men will always be men. Ready to talk about cars only. Charles. Co. Me in. We don't promise museums and restaurants here. Of course. But we guarantee good fishing and a warm welcome. The men obediently entered the house. While Susan quickly set the table. Out of courtesy. She sat with the men for half an hour before heading to her friend's house to discuss her husband's brother. Whom she believed to be a very worthy man. At Chloe's. Susan sat in the kitchen and vividly described the guest. Sharing everything she had learned from him and from her husband. He's a good person but unlucky in his personal life. She said in the end. Unlucky? Chloe asked indifferently. Despite Susan's efforts. The suitor's candidacy failed to impress Chloe. She listened half-heartedly. Her thoughts elsewhere. When he shared his last love. I felt so sorry for him. Although with his money. He could buy anyone. You can't buy love. Chloe sighed. That's true too. Susan agreed with a sigh. Do you want to meet him? Chloe laughed. What's so funny? Susan didn't understand. Even if I wanted to. How can I compete with the city beauties? Besides. I have two children. But he said he always dreamed of a normal family but fell in love with this Helen. Who turned out to be a cuckoo. She left her own child with her mother and went to the capital to build her own personal life. Yes. It's a pity. Of course. Sincerely sympathized Chloe. Chloe had changed a lot over the last few days. As if years had passed. Outwardly. She remained just as attractive. But the spark of someone interested in life had disappeared from her eyes. She kept the house clean. The children were well groomed and fed. She did not forget about herself either. She did not get ungroomed and did not gain extra pounds. She did not eat sweets. To her resentment. She understood she was responsible for her two young children. Who were certainly not to blame that their foster father had betrayed them. And decided to go out on the side. Initially. She waited for Anthony to return and was even ready to forgive him on the condition that the mistress would leave. And he would forget her forever. However. Anthony didn't come back. And it turned out that he was now at the seaside with his mistress. So. Chloe waved off persistent invitations from her friend. Saying. I'm not up for new acquaintances right now. Meanwhile. Charles and Jack were riding a motorcycle through the streets. Laughing. The villagers looked at them with either a smile or disapproval. Charles. Where are you going? Jack yelled. Puh. Inting forward. Charles turned the handlebars. But it was too late. The front wheels sank into the brownish-green slush. And the motorcycle tipped over. And both of them fell into the puddle. Where did you learn to drive? Jack shouted. It was my first time on a motorcycle. Charles excused himself. What's going on here? A stern female voice asked. The men turned and saw Susan standing with her hands on her hips. Glaring at them. Darling. Don't be mad. We were just taking a little ride. Jack explained. I see you're drunk. His wife retorted. Just a little bit. Replied Jack. Charles remained silent. Not looking at Susan but rather at the woman standing behind her, graceful. Thin. With a tired look in her brown eyes. Susan turned to her and said reproachfully. Meet Chloe. This is Charles. The brother of my alcoholic. And apparently. He's an alcoholic too. Hello. Charles stood up and shook off his expensive jeans. You'll excuse us. We've been making some noise. 
Just haven't seen my brother for a long time. Chloe smiled sadly and pulled out a handkerchief. Applying it to his forehead. You're hurt. Come inside. I'll treat your wound. Jack smiled and showed his scraped elbow. I'm hurt too. I need treatment too. I'll treat you in such a way at home that you'll remember it for life. Come on. Get your bike. And let's get home. Susan promised her husband. Pretending to be angry. Charles and Chloe watched as the roaring motorcycle carried the couple up the street. Come on. Chloe opened the gate. In the house. She took out gauze and peroxide. Quickly treating the scrape. The entire time. Charles watched her silently. Seeming to admire her. You have such soft hands. He noted. Chloe blushed. Susan was right. This Charles was undoubtedly attractive. And he did have a sad look in his eyes. They're just hands. She answered him passively. Putting a band-aid on the wound. There. All done. Thank you. He touched the thick strip on his forehead. Do you live alone? With my children. They're at a friend's house right now. And your husband? I don't have a husband. She paused. I don't have a husband anymore. Did you get divorced? Chloe looked into his eyes intently. Charles. It's time for you to go. I have a lot to do. Charles nodded in agreement. Yes. Sorry for the inappropriate questions. I was just curious. Thank you for treating my wound. Later that evening, Charles asked Jack to tell him about Chloe. In general, Anthony went to the sea with his mistress. S. Jack finished his story. Charles shook his head. Oh. And I asked her about her husband. What a fool I am. He said regretfully. Don't worry. You didn't know. His cousin reassured him. So. Did you like her? Charles nodded. Listen. But there's one important thing. Jack reluctantly said. She has two adopted children. I don't see any problem. Charles thoughtfully replied. And that's wonderful. Another plus for her if she has adopted kids. That means she has a kind heart. Jack glanced at his wife. Who only smiled at the corners of her mouth. The next morning. Charles woke up early and went to the nearest town. He bought a gorgeous bouquet of red roses. Belgian chocolates. And French champagne. An hour later. Charles was already standing at Chloe's door. Politely knocking. Two children came out of the house and stared at the guest curiously. Who are you? Me. Charles winked and handed them a box of candies. I'm here for your mother. Is she home? The children grabbed the box and ran into the house. A few seconds later. Chloe appeared in the doorway. Seeing the guest. She involuntarily adjusted her hair and pulled down her long skirt. Hello. Chloe. Charles politely bowed his head. I hope you're not too busy. Are you here for something? She asked. Charles shrugged. I'm just here for you. Meanwhile. Anthony quickly realized that something was wrong with his new passion. As soon as they settled into the hotel. Brittany. A frivolous beauty. Turned into a disgusting shrew right before his eyes. She behaved as if she were a lady that everyone owed something to. She grumpily argued with the administration because she did not get a room with a sea view. Although Anthony had paid for a room without a sea view, she demonstratively pulled the curtains and constantly nagged Anthony that he could have found better vacation conditions. Then Brittany complained about the noise allegedly coming from the broken air conditioner in the room. She started walking around the neighboring rooms to check how loud it was for them. The guests complained about the rude neighbor. And the administration asked her to stop these antics. Instead of relaxing and enjoying herself, she decided to fight to the end and complained to the administrator about the cynical and unprofessional treatment she received. She screamed at the maids. Complained that they were rude to her. Contemptuously called the beach a dirty dump. And the sea a stinky puddle. In addition, she poisoned herself with something in the hotel restaurant and spent two days in the room hugging the toilet. But on Anthony's advice to visit a doctor. She disdainfully replied that she trusted local doctors even less than local chefs. Anthony couldn't help but feel like he was going crazy watching all of this. For this woman. He traded his Chloe. He already knew that this was their first and last vacation together. Anthony was tired of feeling embarrassed by his companion. 
so he abruptly set a condition that either she calmly rests and is content with what she has, or he leaves. After these words, Brittany was offended and left the hotel. Inside, he found Chloe sitting at the kitchen table, laughing and chatting with a handsome man. They both turned to look at Anthony's entrance. Anthony, you're back, Chloe exclaimed, her eyes lighting up. The unfamiliar man stood up, extending his hand. Hey, you must be Anthony. I'm Charles, Chloe's friend. She told me all about you. Anthony, still holding the gifts in his hands, was taken aback. He glanced at Chloe, who looked surprisingly happy. I thought you were away with Brittany, Chloe said, looking at the champagne and chocolates in Anthony's hands. Anthony sighed, realizing his mistake. Brittany turned out to be a disaster. I left her at the seaside and came back. I regret everything. And I just want to make things right. Charles, sensing the tension, excused himself. I should get going. It was nice meeting you. Anthony. As Charles left, Anthony looked at Chloe, searching for a reaction. She seemed unfazed. Anthony. We need to talk. Chloe said calmly. Come to the living room. They sat down. And Anthony began explaining everything that happened with Brittany. He apologized sincerely, expressing regret for his actions. Chloe listened attentively, her expression changing from surprise to understanding. Anthony, I've been through a lot these past days. I found out about your affair. And I was devastated. But then Charles came into my life. And he helped me see things differently. Anthony looked puzzled. Charles? How? He's been a great friend. Supportive and caring. And he made me realize that I deserve better than someone who would betray me. I've decided to move on. Anthony. Chloe said calmly. Anthony was stunned. Processing the unexpected turn of events. Chloe. I love you. I made a mistake. And I'm willing to do whatever it takes to make things right. Chloe sighed. Anthony. Love isn't always enough. Trust is essential. I've found a new path for myself. And I think it's time for both of us to move forward separately. Anthony felt a mix of regret and acceptance. He left the house, leaving the champagne and chocolates behind. As he walked away, he realized the consequences of his actions and the irreversible changes in his life. The guest sat at the kitchen table, enjoying tea, with Chloe seated across from him. Their smiles disappeared simultaneously upon seeing another person entering the room, emitting a low growl. He glared at his wife and took a seat, asserting his dominance as the master of the house. In response, she calmly declared, I don't have to answer to you. Do you believe you have the right to ask me such questions after everything you've done? Anthony remained silent in response to this, wearing a frown as he stared fiercely. Charles, the guest, her appeared unperturbed and retorted mockingly. Who are you? And what are you doing here? Anthony snarled, making sure to mention. Do you know she's my wife? Charles, adopting a mocking tone, replied. I've never seen you before. How should I know? The atmosphere in the house grew tense. Chloe, standing up from her chair, positioned herself between the two men. She calmly addressed her husband. Very soon. I will no longer be your wife. We are getting a divorce. I hope you won't object. I am objecting. We'll see about that. Anthony shouted menacingly, throwing champagne and candies on the floor. Chloe narrowed her eyes and questioned. Was it me who took a mistress and ran off with her to the seas? Anthony, in a snarl, retorted. And you're glad that I have done so. Chloe shouted defiantly. Now I am very happy. And it would be nice if you just left now. Charles felt uncomfortable. Not because he feared Anthony's sudden return. But rather because he found himself in an awkward position as a witness to the family scene. Feeling awkward as a witness to the family scene. Charles decided to intervene. Anthony. Can I talk to you? He suggested. Let's go outside and talk like men. In response. Anthony unleashed a barrage of curses prompting Chloe to push him out of the house. Cursing. Anthony got into his car and drove off. Charles. Now alone with Chloe. 
looked at her seriously and asked. Are you serious about divorcing him? Chloe responded with determination. Absolutely. Charles. Answering quietly. She looked at him in surprise as he took her hand. Which carried the scent of lavender soap. And kissed it. Embarrassed. Ch. Lo quickly withdrew her hand. Expressing concern that they had only known each other for a short time. Charles reassured her. I've met many women. And I always thought I was in love. But then I saw you and realized that there was no love there. I was wrong. Confusing this feeling with passion. Infatuation. Anything. And now I've met you and realized that I love you. Later. After Charles left. Chloe found herself washing the dishes with a smile. Reminiscing about her childhood in the village where her parents took her almost every summer. She recalled how she used to secretly watch a boy leaving flowers under the gate. Only to run away without looking back. Memories flooded her mind. Including the letter in which the boy confessed his love to her. Chloe turned off the water. Quickly wiped her hands. And headed to her bedroom. Digging through her old things. She pulled out a yellowed envelope and read the almost forgotten lines. Pressing the letter to her chest. She burst into tears. Despite missing Anthony. She acknowledged his betrayal. Deeming such actions unforgivable. While Charles seemed sincere in his feelings. Chloe recognized that people sometimes fall in love at first sight. As for her own feelings. She decided that time would be the ultimate judge. Three months later. An ordinary-looking family strolled along the main street of the capital, a father, mother, and two children. The kids marveled at their surroundings. As if everything was a fairy tale. Charles and Chloe smiled as they observed the family. Choosing to keep silent not because they lacked things to say. But because they found pleasure in walking side by side without the need for words. Charles finally broke the silence. Suggesting. How about embracing the status of a married woman again? Chloe replied with a smile. I haven't recovered from the divorce yet. I still hear the curses ringing in my ears. Anthony, refusing to give up without a fight, persistently returned, resorting to begging, pleading, threats, and even attempts to blackmail Chloe using the children. However, each return only served to increase her annoyance as she observed neither pride nor repentance in his behavior. Meanwhile, Charles had returned to his city and regularly called Chloe before revisiting the village to have a serious talk with Anthony. Rather than resorting to threats, Charles chose a different approach. He offered Anthony a significant sum of money, initially met with offense, then contemplation, and, eventually an audacious demand, the house in exchange for agreeing to the divorce. Charles proposed to Chloe that they move in together in his spacious city apartment, allowing Anthony to keep the house. Chloe agreed, especially since there was nothing left for her in the village. Following the deal, Anthony and Chloe swiftly divorced. Chloe remained unaware of the fate of Anthony's mistress. As he simply stated they had broken up. One day, Mrs. Blake, the owner of the house where Brittany had stayed, visited. She revealed that Brittany had returned to her native village and found employment at a poultry farm. None of her bright plans for marriage, education, or financial stability had come to fruition. Now faced with the reality of living with a mercenary and unfaithful man, Chloe struggled to come to terms with the situation. She decided to distance herself from any information about Anthony. Grateful for the adoption of her children, she appreciated the support of Charles, who reassured her. Forget about him. You've left the house. Let him live as he wants. You're here with me and the children too. She nodded and smiled. And the autumn sky responded in kind. A moment ago gloomy and unfriendly. The sun emerged from behind leaden clouds. Casting its warm glow over the wet cobblestones. It played in the windows with golden flashes. Danced across the reliefs of the buildings. And illuminated the square. Chloe. In that instant, felt a surge of brightness and happiness. The clouds that had lingered in her soul seemed to disperse. And the long-awaited sun finally revealed itself. That's all for today's story. If you like it, please subscribe and give it a thumbs up. See you next time.